Good morning. Welcome to the Decatur Book Festival, Session 2, presented by Emory University. I'm Jerry Williamson. I'm co-captain for the sanctuary and for this session. Before our, our program starts, I have just a few housekeeping things that I need to say. <clears throat> our, our authors and our moderator will be signing books after the session um, at the table sponsored by Eagle Eye. The volunteers will direct you to the signing tables. We are asking everyone that you leave through the rear of the sanctuary, and the signing tent will be around to the left. <clears throat> there will be no Q&A at the end of the session today. And if you didn't bring a book, but you want, we urge you to, to buy the books, Eagle Eye is our bookseller for this session. Remember that the Decatur Book Festival is a nonprofit. It depends on sponsors and donations to bring these wonderful authors to us every year. <clears throat> Please consider making a tax deductible do donation. <clears throat> you can go to their website to donate. <laughs> Lastly, Please take a moment to turn off anything that makes a noise. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, please welcome Joe Barry Carroll, who is the moderator for our session. He's a... Well, thank you. Mr. Off to Carroll. a good start. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you my introduction first. I'm sorry. <laughs> I promised her I'd behave and follow directions, and there I am <laughs> and already. Did, and you did approve what I'm going to say. I did, I did. <laughs> He's a former NBA All-Star, artist, publisher, award-winning author, philanthropist, wealth advisor, Renaissance man. His philanthropy has established Broadview Foundation that supports African-American students, communities, and nonprofit organizations. And his book sales have funded Georgia, the Georgia Innocence Project, the Atlanta Public Broadcasting Station, WABE, ACLU, Repairs of the Breach, and many other nonprofit entities. He has authored four books, Paintings by Carol, and he will also be signing books today. His new book is My View from Seven Feet in Paintings and Narratives. And he, we want to welcome Mr. Carroll. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Those of you way in the back, we're not going to be asking questions later, so you can come up early. You come up near. Come near. Um, it's not going to be an like exam on anything. I'd like to introduce our authors. Um, Patricia Schultz is the author of the number one New York Times bestsellers, A Thousand Places to See Before You Die, and A Thousand Places to See in the United States and Canada Before You Die. She is a veteran travel journalist with over 30 years of experience. Show you what we're talking about. Writing for Fromers, Berlitz, and Access Travel Guides, as well as Wall Street Journal, Condé Nast Traveler, and other magazines and newspapers. Her home is in, New York, is in New York City. Her new book is Why We Travel, 100 Reasons to See the World. And, and I want to add that um, Jason Fry is unable to be with us today because he's um, hunkered down in Florida trying to stay safe. So he sends his regards. Here's his book. I believe that'll be at the table as well. For those of you expecting him, we'll have to do today. <laughs> Spencer Tunnell, Tunnell, you'll pardon me. I'm from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. I never lost that way we talk down there, so bear with me. 
uh, is a landscape architect. He's past chair of the Atlanta Urban Design Commission, has taught at the School of Environmental Design at the University of Georgia, Georgia State University, and serves on the board of the Olmsted Linear, 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 thank you, Park and National Association of Olmsted Parks. He received his degrees in landscape architecture and architecture history from the University of Virginia. And next to him and his co-writer is Jennifer Richardson, author and historian, has lived in Druid Hills for 67 years, served on the board. I got to show the book. <laughs> uh, served on the board of the Olmsted Park Society and serves on the Olmsted Linear Park Alliance Board. The book is Olmsted's Linear Park by Jennifer J. Richardson Spencer Tunnell. I've been rehearsing. <laughs> Thank you, one and all, for being here. Jennifer, tell us about your book. What should we know about your book? About my book? Yeah, you got the microphone. Yes. About my book? Yes. Um, I began about you and, you, and, you and Spencer's book. You wrote it together, right? Yes, we did. Yeah. What part did you play? Oh, I wrote all of it. I'm just giving him the credit. <laughs> <laughs> How generous of you. What, what is it about? It's about the, um, the last uh, design that Frederick Law Olmsted did in his life. It's the, um, the suburb of Druid Hills, which he designed, and also the Linear Park, which is uh, segments of parkland, each one a little different than the other, and all um, e equaling about 40 acres, going down the center of Ponce Leon Avenue. I became interested in Olmsted in 1983 when my dear friend Sally Harbaugh uh, recruited me to join the Olmsted Park Society of Atlanta Incorporated. And at the time we were fighting a major expressway through our park. And uh, I'm still involved with Olmsted all these years later. So that's uh, one of the things that people kept saying to me over and over was, um, you have such great knowledge about it, and it's all going to go away when you're gone. So I decided we needed to write it down, and who better to collaborate with than the person who did all the designs for our renovation of the park, and that's Spencer Tunnell. Spencer, where do we locate this land, this park, this space? If you go about a block and then turn right, and then walk about a mile and a half, you'll bump right into it. Okay. So the park- Street-wise, what, what, what streets are those? It, it is, the park divides Ponce de Leon Avenue. And so, but when, when Joel Hurt designed this, or got the suburb started, he wanted to connect Atlanta to Decatur. Now Hurt, he's the big building guy that we see these, all these little uh, triangle-like buildings throughout, not just Atlanta, but in other cities as well, right? Right, so Joel Hurt was an you know, amazing entrepreneur, uh, started his career as a civil engineer, which is not unlike Olmsted, and then he, he, when he came back to Atlanta, one of his classmates at the University of Georgia was Henry Grady, which, you know, so the, the college class at Franklin College then was pretty small, but he was, um, quite the standout, and when he came to Atlanta, he just came in with an amazing entrepreneurial energy and knew that he could improve the city. So physically, this area, this region that many of us probably take for granted, we drive by, I drove through it coming here, as a matter of fact, um, is bordered by Ponce and then North where? The, the neighborhood actually goes a little bit beyond North Decatur Road. The northeast corner of the land is the quadrangle of Emory University, and then the western boundary of the neighborhood is Briarcliff Road. Okay. So one of the um, connections we were trying to make is whenever you travel in different countries and different cities, a lot of the locals, they pass these great places all the time. You go to Paris, some people never been to the Eiffel Tower. You know, you go into different areas, San Francisco, I lived there for a long time, never went to Golden State Park or anything like that. So, and we're kind of thinking that this is part of, because um, they, they were just sharing with me in the, 
it back in the room there that they have a lot of international travelers. So we thought this might make a nice little companion to Patricia's book that talks a lot about the culture of travel. And that's going to give me there, I want to, I want to ask you to talk a little bit about why we travel, the book. Not all at one time, but a little bit. Um, it is a very interesting pairing of titles um, because I've always said, and it's been brought to everyone's attention, especially because of the pandemic, that what we have at our, finger, at our literal fingertips can be as fascinating and educational and inspiring and beautiful. You live in this area. I live uh, in New York, so all along the East Coast. We have some of our most historically rich and important cities and settlements in the early years, um, in the first European settlements in this country. And just the natural beauty. Um, I think these past few days have had us reappreciate or re-understand, comprehend all over again with a newfound um, respect for what we've almost lost. Um, and it's interesting to be here speaking with people who are putting a spotlight on what is local and um, available to us. I do have a tendency to go to far more remote destinations of the world, but I think it's everything in between. And so my books, 1,000 Places, were always very much that. I tried to always um, put the spotlight on both the humble and the unknown, be it in our backyard or on the other side of the globe. Because every time we leave our front door, and it doesn't need to be anything ex exaggerated or extravagant or expensive, it just is all about curiosity, I think. And I often wonder where that curiosity that we have as children, where it goes. And when you travel, I think it stokes our curiosity and it really keeps it alive. And Olmsted was lucky enough, maybe his parents were travelers. My parents never were, but I had enough curiosity in me to get up and go on my own once I could. And everything you see, the people you meet along the way, the foods you experience, the, the um, museums, the, the natural beauty, everything somehow becomes a part of you. And you bring that home with you. And that's why one of the aphorisms in the book, Why We Travel, is about how um, the world is a classroom without walls. So we've all had fine education. Some of us maybe not so much. My father dropped out of school when he was 11 or 12, but always had a real appreciation and respect for academia. So I did have a good, um, very solid foundation, but I've always believed that everything that was really of importance to me I found or I experienced through my travels. Again, didn't need to be anything that required a passport, although that is only good. I think 35% um, of Americans have passports, and then you always wonder how many of those 35% are actually using those passports. But that's a whole lot of people who don't. But again, look what we have in the United States of America. It's a massive country, and it's just chock-a-block from coast to coast with all kinds of possibilities. Our national parks alone, our state parks, and even those places that don't really um, meet the criteria for being designated or recognized as a state or federal park are, can be as um, insightful and in interesting um, as the Grand Canyon as our newest state park, which is in West Virginia. We have an awful lot, and um, hopefully this book, Why We Travel, will encourage people to stop Netflixing, get out of your sweatpants. Or the take pandemics. Netflix with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and hopefully, you know, we're all understanding that um, because of the pandemic, we um, can travel to postpone no pleasure. Things are lifting. Um, requirements are easing, and we should, I think, resume traveling. If we never have, I hope we all do. We all start. Let me ask you, um, and I'm actually going to share this question with all of our panelists about, there's a great writer, uh, songwriter, Curtis Mayfield, who says, uh, we share the same fears, share the same tears, die in so many years, reflecting on the commonality that we all share. And all of us who've traveled 
near and far, we have this experience where we go like, wow, that's just like at home. Those people are just like our people. Do you have an example of that for yourself in your travels? Oh, I have a couple million. Well, we're going to start with one. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think the easiest way to really have it resonate and ring home is to be invited, to be lucky enough to be invited into anyone's home. Um, and not that I invite myself, <laughs> but I do accept invitations um, usually, but I am... I am aware that you need to be cautious, and uh, I travel alone a lot, so I don't, um, you know, knock on just any door and let myself in. But there was one incident in uh, Morocco when our flight was canceled. We wound up taking a four-hour road trip to our next destination instead of the 45-minute flight that actually had never existed to be canceled in the first place, but that's another story. Um, you know, when in Rome, when in Casablanca. So um, we found the loveliest gentleman who had um, a Mercedes, which turned out to be a 1962 dilapidated excuse for a Mercedes that was held together it by... It was still a Mercedes. Still a Mercedes, and it got us there <laughs> maybe in twice as long a time period that it should have. But anyway, um, we were starving. By then it was four or five hours that we were trying to understand um, how to salvage the day. And we said, but first, we need the best couscous in town, thinking that he would bring us to some dive. Why, where why all couscous? Couscous is a national dish. It takes I mean, hours. Why, why for you? Was that something that you had become some uh, affection for early on, or you've always wanted to go to Morocco and have couscous? Yeah, when you go to Morocco, you have couscous. When you come to you know, the South, you have barbecue. When you go to Italy, you have pasta. But couscous is a grain. It's centuries and centuries old. They you know, include vegetables, fresh vegetables and spices. The Moroccan cuisine is really quite incredible. Anyway, he brought us home. Um, it took us a while to get there, and I wasn't quite sure that it was going to turn out as fantastic as it did, but um, his family was there to greet us. Uh, his mother, his wife, his two children, and pretty much the entire village. And in those three or four hours that I spent in his home, we felt very um, honored but we also felt very much at home because the dynamics of a family gathering around the table, it was Friday, which is their day of, um, it's the Islamic day of prayer, and it's um, the sense of hospitality in the Moroccan people goes back millennia and is global, it's universal. You can go anywhere in the world and if you knock on the right door, you find a family that's very, um, welcoming and warm and will invite you in and they just um, want to share with you what little they have be it food or a roof over their heads mm -hmm. um, the love between the grandmother and the other two generations this was a three generational three generational experience and we were treated, um, I would say like royalty, but most importantly, we were treated like family. And that has happened many, many times. And it does have you think, there's also a wonderful quote by Maya Angelou, but don't ask me to quote what it says, but it just says that at the end of the day, we are very, very, very much similar. And we all pretty much share the same DNA if you go far enough, you know, a deeper dive. We share more, much more than we do. We have more similarities than we do differences. So, Jennifer, for you, in your travels, when you leave the park, when you leave this community, have you had that special experience, not necessarily that one, but one that left an impression on you? Away from the park. Um, I've traveled all over the world. I've been lucky. Um, I played in an orchestra when I was 17. In, what is uh, your instrument? Uh, well, then it was flute. Now it's flute and harp and keyboard. But I played flute back then, and um, we toured... Uh, we got a keyboard Spain. right over there. You want to whip one out for us? <laughs> That's an organ. <laughs> um, okay, details, details. So <laughs> um, I, was, I was invited to perform, and we went as part of, a, um, a, I guess, a goodwill tour for, from the State Department um, to Franco, Spain, and also to Portugal. And so I met a lot of people that had very different 
um, li lives and lifestyles for myself. Um, there were guards on the streets of Madrid, and they had guns and, and weapons, and it was pretty frightening. And I, I really began to think more about how much safer I felt in the United States. I was in Argentina going... So they scared you back home? <laughs> not, no, I had to stay for the whole rest of the tour. But I was in Argentina once, and I was on a bridge between um, Argentina and Peru, and uh, we were searched. Uh, my car was searched. They were looking for electronics, not drugs, and we didn't have either one. And I remember standing there with all these guys with guns and thinking, my American passport doesn't mean anything right now. We can, they can toss us in the river, and that's the end of that. But back to the park, I've met all kinds of people uh, around the park who, uh, here in Atlanta who are very different than I am. Um, there's, there's a couple of street people that I know very well who are in the park. There's a woman who sits on one of our benches quite regularly who um, smokes Marlboro cigarettes and throws the cigarette butts down by the bench and I collect them and put them in a bag and throw them away. We have another guy that I call Turban Man who believes that he's receiving signals from outer space uh, in our So park. you get to stay at home for your adventure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's just, um, and, and the stories of the people around the park, the, the scandal, the scam, the, the very wealthy people who moved around this park because it was considered the centerpiece of a wonderful new neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Spencer. What's on your checklist? What are you looking for when you travel? Um, what yeah. factors? Like if you had a checklist of this is going to be interesting because it has one, two, three. Well, in the, in the green room, uh, Patricia mentioned something about the, the corollary between danger and adventure. And I had never paired the two before, except just walking across the street in Atlanta can be both. Um, <laughs> And you know, there, there, uh, some years ago I was in Scotland, and it, it, I think it's the being open to the serendipity of travel, where you just don't know exactly what you're going to experience. And in this one instance, I'm driving the back roads of Scotland, and it's July 4th, and being a good American, I put on a red, white, and blue tie and a coat, and then I went through 40 degree rains and then 70 degree sunny afternoons in, in Scotland. And I stumbled upon, not unlike the Outlander, a ring of standing stones that I had no idea was there. It wasn't in any guidebook. I pulled over, went to go see this, and, and I, did, I, I came back, and I came back in the same time frame that I left in. <laughs> Didn't I? Um, I'm not sure. But it was one of those things where you, I, I, I wasn't looking for that but I was open to it. And, and, and that was one of the most remarkable experiences. Um, there was another later that same day, I'm driving across a road that was on a map, but it could only be described as a varicose vein. I mean, it was barely a road. And I got to the top of this hill and it was one of the most breathtaking sights I've ever seen. And it just left me breathless. Mm. But that was something that was completely unplanned. But it was also, um, it, it, it's in those moments, uh, those nonlinear <laughs> moments from, never mind the linear part, it's in those nonlinear moments when you can experience, whether it's the glory of nature or, or the serendipity. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one other travel adventure that I had, which was in Denmark, and it was to design a garden. Okay, we got that part done, and the, going back and forth between the metric system and feet and inches was a challenge. And the fact that the Danes, there are only 5 million Danish speakers in the world, so most of them are taught English. But then the challenge was we had to build this garden, which I hadn't expected. So you go into a nursery, I know no Danish, but the Latin name of plants, this is the thing we've all been taught in school since the time we were nine or 10. Latin is a dead language and it doesn't change and it's the universal language. I could say the name of the Latin name of plants and everybody knew what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And then they, you know, the, the owners 
aunt was like, oh, so dismissive. You can't do that. We have clay soils. I'm like, Lord, clay soils. What do I know about clay Don't soils? Hate. Don't you hate when they say that? This is my happy place. That just destroys my exactly. day. Exactly. <laughs> that it, destroys my day when they confuse <laughs> clay soil with whatever no, other soil. No, not exists. clay soils. Yeah. But it was just, it, <laughs> but when we got down to building it, they brought in these Danish pig farmers to be the, day, the laborers. And I was talking to them about, you know, digging a hole here and moving a rock here. And they looked at me blankly. And of course, I'm aware that I'm in a sanctuary in a Baptist church. So um, I will not say what I said to these Danish farmers. They'll, they'll forgive you. I don't think they will, actually. <laughs> but after projecting in a way that didn't require a microphone, it was clear that they understood every English word that I said, and it was a complete test, and they got to work, and me, it, the language barrier just vaporized. Let me, what, what, what do we see when we're looking for a landscape architect? How does your work show up in, when we go through the park or any place that we're seeing that's different perhaps than, is there a difference between the land and the building? Absolutely. Well, the, this is one of the things we're landscape now, architecture. I'm, I'm going to want the brief answer yeah, to right. this. <laughs> Olmsted was the father of American landscape architecture. It's okay. The way that the land is shaped, the way we respond to the land. So that if you think about um, figure ground, the object, the architect is creating the object, and the landscape is the context within which that building exists. I'm still with you. Go ahead. Oh, you're still waiting? No, okay. I'm, no, I'm still with you. No, okay, good. Saying, <laughs> okay, great. Can I, can I just segue on what Spencer said? No, and no, add? no, you can't. No, I I'm can't. Just, oh, I'm no. joking. I'm joking. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you're taller than I am, so I'll obey. <laughs> but I'm harmless. Don't, okay. don't be afraid. <laughs> Never had a fight in my life. <laughs> okay. I hear you. Well, I was just going to say that I am not a landscape architect. I'm a gardener. But there are times in the Olmsted Park when I walk around um, that, that dirt road that you were discussing, Spencer, and I see a new vista, a new, um, a new beautiful uh, ginkgo that's yellow leaves and they're all starting to fall. And I think that's what Olmsted excelled at, is this beckoning you to go forward, uh, to walk further down this aisle or this place to see what's coming up next. And, and it changes all the time, and that's what's miraculous to me. Hmm. It's about landscape, is it changes. Beautiful. Patricia, you talk about curiosity. I hear the word, but how, do you, how would you describe that to us in terms of the, the, uh, what curiosity brings to travel or the interplay of it? I understood that I had a lot of curiosity, well, in retrospect, I now see that I had a lot of curiosity at four. Um, my first memory ever was not of meeting Santa Claus or getting my first bicycle or anything of that nature, but I was in the back seat of the old family station wagon and we were off to Atlantic City. Woohoo! Very um, important for a four-year-old to know that every August, like clockwork, we were off to someplace new and exciting, very exotic for me. Um, we weren't one to, we weren't a family that would do anything more um, elaborate or, parentheses, costly, because um, life was simple back then in the 50s. But, um, my parents understood on some level that to remove ourselves from our little bubble, which was a very comfortable and a very lovely bubble, I live in the Hudson Valley of New York State, so it's one of the most historically important and physically beautiful valleys that we have in the U.S., but to explore something beyond that and to kind of have the door thrown open to understand and explore that there was a whole world. Imagine the sun, the sand, the seagulls. It was all new and it was all exciting. And to keep that excitement and to keep that, that open view of what lies beyond, 
in my time as a four-year-old, that was my worldview. But at least I realized early on and was encouraged to continue to think that way that there was a whole lot beyond what was familiar and what was available and um, everything that was happening in my population of 10,000 town, um, a scrappy New York state town, the New York Times once called it, and it is now very, very of the moment. Beacon on the Hudson, it's called. Um, but Pete Seeger, the famous folk singer, composer, musician, was from Beacon. And he made popular um, the song, This Land is Your Land, This Land is My Land. And I just thought that um, he was, you know, the prophet that had us continuously reminded that it's a big country. There is a lot beyond just our tiny little bubble. Um, but you need to make the effort, and I think parents need to understand that the kids aren't too young, and they will remember. They might not remember specifics, but they'll remember the experience, and they'll bring it with them. And so the kids are never too young, the grandparents are never too old. As long as you can wheel them around, there's always something to see and explore and, and um, widen your horizons, which in, then yeah. widen your, your, your worldview. And it's a kind of investment. Yeah. And it stokes and hones your curiosity over time. I don't know where it goes, you know, the curiosity of a four-year-old or an eight-year-old or 11-year-old. It seems to kind of dissipate or be but, but you seem to maintain that with respect to your choice and your travels. And you couple that later, you talk about and respect. Could you touch on that respect relationship to this curiosity? Yeah, I think they go hand in hand, and if you continue to remain, and you do need a little bit of a concerted effort. I don't know how naturally it comes when you're 30 or 60 or 90. Um, you, you know, kind of settle into the uh, rut or the same old, same old that's very comfortable and it's very familiar and it's um, very predictable and there are no surprises and no, you know, it's, it's comfortable. It's the comfort zone that we all talk about. And it was always a little too comfortable for me. It didn't seem that anything really um, of import or anything very exciting happened in that comfort zone. Uh, so I was always looking beyond and I was always following my curiosity and found, you know, like all these decades later, I still think I get excited, as excited about all of the Atlantic cities of the world, which a lot of people may kind of poo-poo because how exciting can the Jersey Shore be? But whether you're four years old or you're much older than that, I think the mere fact that um, it's something new and exciting and it's, the, um, it's removing yourself. I um, thought I was the luckiest kid on the block when I was back then in the back seat, and I still feel very much the same way. We can get passports. I was referring before, we have a very strong passport, and we can get it very easily, and that people choose not to ever leave their couch. Um, Where does the respect easy. come in to the, the equation? Sorry? The respect portion. I in think that um, is, that's kind of a knee-jerk, without question, um, companion emotion that goes with curiosity. Because if your head is open, and with that comes acceptance and tolerance, and uh, a certain um, respect, you know, you, you see that we were talking before about how at the end of the day, we all very, very much want the same things. A lot of people get a little sidetracked, don't we all? Um, but at the end of the day, our road, our path, our, our, um, our aspirations in life are the same, and that is to live a life where we give, um, we receive, we um, do what's best for the next guy, and the golden rule, you hope to be treated as you treat others, or you, um, you want to share uh, the, uh, the aims and the aspirations of your fellow man, your neighbor, your family, the next 
um, from the next town over, from the next country over, the next continent, wherever you are in the world, you essentially see the same things, that there are good people everywhere, um, and how they live their lives. So many things that are really, really commonplace, how you know the kids get to school, what they're studying, what, how they dress, um, what parents will talk about at the end of the day when they gather over their meal, how was your day? It's all very much the same, and it's rewarding to see it in the first um, person, and not just to see it on the screen, but to actually be there and travel outside what you know, and to understand that what you're experiencing in Europe or in South America or in the South Pacific Islands is very similar um, and yet very exciting at the same time. I'm going to go to Jennifer. What? Why is the park a treasure? It's reference. You reference it in the book as a national treasure. Is there a particular aspect of it that you were considering when you said that? Well, I think of the Olmsted Lanier Park as a treasure because to me it is a work of art. It's just that Mr. Olmsted used plant material and the terrain and the, the lay of the land instead of watercolor or oil paints. And in terms of a treasure, it's because, as I said before, it keeps changing. Its beauty is, is changing. And you can go every day and it'll be different. When I first moved close to the park in 1970, um, I did not know that that was an Olmsted Park. It was grown up, it was decrepit, it was filled with glass and trash. And the reason was because the city was not taking care of it and a, a major expressway was planned in the area. So I walked on the sidewalks. And then when I discovered that it was an Olmsted design and began looking into Olmsted, as, as a result of being in the Olmsted Park Society, I began dreaming of what it could be and what Mr. Olmsted had thought about when he built it in 1905. And uh, I wanted to see it that way again, but it seemed like a remote dream at that when, point. When were those glory days? There was a, a kind of a glorious period. Um, in the book, you talk about the Coca-Cola family, the Candlers, the Hertz. Uh, Padea, Equifax, all these families and enterprises that were present or supported that environment. Wh what happens that all of that goes away to a place to where you're, you're, you want to walk on the sidewalk instead of walking through it? That's a great question. In the early days... Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the early days, every single rich, influential Atlantan came to live along or near the Olmsted Linear Park. And that was because Mr. Olmsted and Joel Hurt realized that it was a drawing card. Today, developers would have built right on the park itself just to make more money on the houses. But Olmsted said, if you build a park here, everybody will want to live around it. And so we had Asa Candler, who, who owned the Coca-Cola company. And we had Preston Arkwright, who was the head of Georgia Power and the Atlanta Gaslight and the Atlanta Street Railway. And we had um, the, the Elsa's family, who owned the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill. And I'll just add here briefly that um, Asa Candler, who was helping develop this, was so forward in his thinking, he did not ban Jewish families from living in Druid Hills. He had many Jewish friends, and unlike other developments in Atlanta where Jews were banned from living there, Druid Hills was not. And so you had prominent Jewish families and Gentile families, and that was the heyday of the park. There was lots of money, it was beautiful. Things began to change, I think there were several things that happened. One was that uh, there was a murder in Druid Hills. Henry Hines, who was Lucy Candler Hines' husband, was murdered in his mansion along the park. People were frightened. This happened in the 40s, so it was long before the kind of things that you see today. Another thing that seemed to happen to me is that the, the, people, the children of the original founders wanted to move to a more prestigious area, and that was Buckhead. So they began moving out. Then we had, um, we had World War II, which meant that a lot of the big mansions were turned into boarding houses for soldiers who came back to live in. And finally, times just change, and Ponce de Leon was zoned for high-rise buildings and no one wants to live around a four-lane expressway or high-rise building, so they fled. And at that point, with a road on the horizon to be run right through the park, 
its ability to be beautiful and to be a work of art and a treasure was pretty much taken away and it was left to be a decrepit eyesore. And the, the way that it was turned around is the real miracle. Uh, it, it appears that when we travel throughout the world, we're always visiting places that used to be something mm -hmm. and something happened. And oftentimes we just go right through it. Uh, Spencer, you referenced uh, preventing it from falling through the cracks of apathy. Is there something that, um, that happens, I mean, is this inevitable that we're gonna have this change or is there some way that we're vigilant that we can preserve the best parts of our culture and our society, the thing we're most proud of, it seemed like it's always uh, subject to decline and fall. Right, um, the, 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 <laughs> the spiral down into entropy, um, if you don't add energy to a system, it, en entropy starts to take over. That, that sounds real pretty. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, it means a, an object at, at rest in front of the TV watching Netflix will wake up there the next morning. If you don't add energy to that system, if you don't keep moving, you're going to slow down and rot. All right? <laughs> so I also have to... It, it note that the, the, the quote about apathy and the, it, it creeping back through the cracks, that's from Gary Kas Kasparov, the um, chess grandmaster. I, I have to... You know, I don't know him, and you're here, no, so I'm going to give right, you credit for good, it. But, <laughs> but he, it was about that the evil comes no, back I, through I, the cracks I, in our yes. apathy. And it's, it's, to me, it's the, the statement about... Um, about how quickly history is forgotten. There are, there are children that are growing up in Druid Hills today that don't have the experience that Jenny has of, of what the parks were like in the 60s and 70s. It's, the parks have always looked great. And so they don't know that this has required a conscious, deliberate effort and a continual lesson in civics to make sure that this doesn't happen again because G dot does not rest. Like a millipede, like a millipede, the, the head can get chopped off, the back legs just keep on How do you on really feel about G dot? <laughs> Have you got some time? Is <laughs> um, and it's not that, that it's not that that is, <laughs> but, but it is that, that, that thread of history is so tenuous. There is a, a Druid Hills resident writing to the Olmsted firm in 1930, and she is writing to them saying, you know, there's a group coming to Atlanta in, in next year, and we really want to spruce up this park. I have heard a rumor that you all were involved in this. Now, that was just in 20 years, that thread, that connection to the father of American landscape architecture had shredded completely. Mm. And that, that tenuous thread of history is so important. I, when you talk about change over time, sorry, I got a live mic, what am I gonna do? I was in London visiting a friend. We wandered, it was a heat wave in London, oh my God. It was 85 degrees, oh my God, a heat wave. <laughs> the windows in all these gentlemen's clubs were open. People were out in the street drinking at five o'clock in the afternoon. In, normally they'd be drinking at five o'clock inside. Now they were outside. We wandered through Regent Park, which was first a, a, a park for the elite only. We climbed this hill, it was Primrose Hill, which is where a, a ring of standing stones had been in Celtic times, and it's still part of a park. From there, we watched this lightning storm over London, and every time lightning hit a downtown building of London, these sons of Celts and Druids applauded like it was a fireworks display. It was amazing. And, and it was, and, you know, it was pouring rain, but there we are in this site that used to be a ring of standing stones, and it was still a park, and it's still this place that's got this resonance and this history. And so, but, you know, connecting the dots of, you know, Olmsted was seeking to create a transcendent experience in park users. He wanted people to connect to nature in a way that was real that was visceral, you know, and connect with nature. And he would do it in the pastoral, 
like in Central Park and in these open spaces and the, the soft landscape of the Hudson Valley, but also in these incredibly muscular, masculine places like Yosemite, which, which have this awe-inspiring um, quality to them. And there's a, a tie, Olmsted's role in the preservation of Yo Yo Yosemite was incredibly important. And the Yo Yosemite Valley and Druid Hills are about the same amount of acreage. It's bizarre. That's 1,400, right? 1,400? That's right. Yeah. I wanted to um, add something about Mr. Olmsted because um, still already seeing my life as being divided between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, um, I know that um, we're all glued to our TVs, and you probably saw how New York City was extremely, exceptionally hard hit by the pandemic, to the point where we were living life quite normally in our chaotic 25-8, you know, MO one day, and then the next day everything was shut down and boarded up and deserted and surreal in a way that the only other time I had experienced that was September 11th. And there was a lot that was very similar. And there was a lot in how we all came together in New York City, helping each other, but at a distance. We were leaving food in front of the um, seniors that lived in our building at their door rather than bringing it in and sitting with them and, and talking. But we were all there for each other. But what saved me was Central Park, which was um, really a gift to New York City and every tourist and visitor who has ever come to New York City over time, because it's so big and it's so special and it's so beautiful. And every day at five o'clock, I was in the park for an hour. And that connection was really what helped me keep my sanity. Um, there were lot of people in the park, um, masked, keeping their distance, um, that I would see at the same time every day. And from one season to the next, I followed the change of time, and I had some idea of the importance of forest bathing, which is this ex expression that has, at least recently, it seems. You were naked in the park? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being silly. Of course she wasn't. I was going to avoid naked. that, but hey, <laughs> let me, let me we have no you. secrets. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> please, please complete your an, thought. I apologize. <laughs> it's an, Not really. I intended to say that, but I'm going to apologize. <laughs> but what an image. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> No, thank you. Um, so forest bathing <laughs> is this age-old expression about just merely immersing yourself in nature. It doesn't need to be a forest per se, but it does need to have some semblance of the natural. And I understood every single time I approached the park from my you know, concrete jungle home that it was this oasis. And not only, I mean, it could have been a wild, forsaken, you know, square block of you know, abandoned trees, or it could have been this massive swath of beautiful man-created or man-enhanced um, parkland that are the lungs of Manhattan, it's our playground, and it was our salvation during that full year, and actually it was more like two years during the pandemic. And um, I came to know about Olmsted prior, much prior to that. I mean, anybody who comes to New York makes a beeline for Central Park because it's where it's all happening all these years later. But um, then as time went by, I came to understand just how prolific he was and how important and what a trailblazer he was. So thank you, Mr. Olmsted. Let me ask you about the, um, throughout the book, it seems like you're sharing some of your personal experiences in travel, and then you talk uh, philosophically, or you offer these aphorisms, or what, what did, why did you refer to those? The aphorisms. Aphorisms. <laughs> um, how did that come to be? Because it seems like it's, it's a beautiful smoothing out of some of the complication of different cultures and different lays of, uh, lay of land. I think um, what you're saying is very true. You kind of have to lean into and just relax about uh, travel because people get very anxious. They talk themselves into thinking it's too complicated, it's too expensive, it's too 
um, two, two, it's not them, they can't find anybody to travel. You know, there are all of these reasons that people don't travel, but I think you just need to make the decision. Tony Wheeler, who is the founder of the guidebook chain Lonely Planet, always said something that resonated with me, and it's just that getting out the front door is the most important thing, is the easiest thing. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's the most difficult thing because everything after that, in fact, falls into place. Uh, we were talking before about serendipity and how it is the best tour guide. Um, you plan and you book and you have every last imaginable moment of your time abroad, whether it's three days or three weeks, and you want to maximize wherever you're going, whether it's the road trip to 11 different national parks or you're bringing your kids to London for the first time or it's three generations, you've rented a, a, a country home in Tuscany, and you want to plan and make sure that not a moment is wasted. And guess what? It's all of those... Um, unforeseen, unpredictable moments or hours or days that are empty that you think are going to be boring because so they were somehow overlooked and that's when all the good stuff happens. But um, I think the beauty of travel is just to do it. And um, I was just reading yesterday a, an interview with Warren Buffett, um, and it was by one of the, the um, more erudite publications that I never read, but hey, it was on social media. So um, it was like pages and pages and pages you had to finally read like for an hour and a half before you got to the four words that he said were going to be, um, you know, your, your guiding light. And he said, do what you love. And for me, it's travel, but if it's um, landscaping, or if it's painting, or if it's cooking, or if it's raising your family, or if it's basketball, or if it's anything, um, I think the important thing is to recognize and understand what sparks your joy, what makes you happy, what gives meaning to your life. And again, I hate to keep dwelling on this pandemic because hopefully it is very much behind us, but it gave us that moment to kind of step back and understand what we love and what makes us happy and why we do what we do um, because it fills us up and it gives us an appreciation for it and makes our life fuller and more richer. And uh, that's why the book Why We Travel is written. But I did try to incorporate life lessons and not just lessons about travel or how to travel or why we travel, but what makes our life rich. Um, it's an investment in our life. And there's that wonderful expression about how it's the only thing you can buy that makes you richer. Give me the last part. The only thing what? It's the only thing you buy, travel, that makes you richer. Ah. Jennifer, I want to ask, part of that richness of moving about, or you referenced some of the colorful people in the park, uh, what, is there a separation between adventure and danger, or is it just merely a matter of the outcome? What, what was an adventure, if you survive it, it's an adventure. If you don't, it was dangerous. How do you approach that with respect to all the places you go, either locally or internationally? Well, I was thinking um, while you were talking that when I excitedly told friends, I'm going to go to South America, and they all said, why? <laughs> and I was like, well, why not? And also, I wanted to mention that, um, that during the COVID epidemic, the worst of it, the people walking in the Olmsted Park just increased in numbers hugely and it was so great to see people out there, perhaps discovering it for the first time. I am not a risk taker, so I'm not into dangerous stuff. I left Florida to You've escape. You've been talking to people who see things in the park. That's a risk, <laughs> man. <laughs> I, I left Florida to escape the hurricane under a mandatory uh, evacuation. I, I wasn't tempted to stick around and see what a hurricane could do to the East Coast. Um, but for me, uh, being able to see something in a safe way and to see how it's to see beauty and to have the experience of enrichment is what is so meaningful to me. And whether you're in the Olmsted Linear Park or you're in downtown London or Paris or, um, or on, on the river in Athlone where my, my Irish friends live, where I go a lot, um, it's, it's always new, it's always different, 
but I always find that I'm comfortable. And I like what you said about do what you love because I love to travel. I don't want to be in a situation where it's dangerous, but sometimes I step on the edge of that and that's okay. But how can you know, Patri um, Patricia, how do you know? I mean, cause you've been a bit of an adventurer since that four year, four, four year old uh, journey out onto the beach without your parents. Do you, do you have a um, instinct about uh, Muhammad when you were in Morocco that this would be okay and we won't you know show up missing as they say <laughs> go MIA in Casablanca um, when, I, I, when I think of some of the places I've been I'm like wow you really took a chance there and I'm seven feet 300 pounds <laughs> <laughs> so, we I'm one, <laughs> so I'm wondering how do you approach that as a explorer of sorts um, I think that we, well, first of all, I'm from New York City, so I have an immediate <laughs> je ne sais quoi. Um, I like to think that I'm a pretty good judge of character, um, and you are on guard when you leave home, um, and I mean as much about leaving my, the safety of my apartment um, and going out into Midtown Manhattan as I do arriving in a, an airport, be it Chicago or Hong Kong. I travel differently when I'm with someone else, be it one person or a small group, be it um, a spouse, significant other, friend, sibling, uh, stranger, guide. Uh, you kind of let your guard down, which is not always a good thing, but it's natural, and it is a certain degree of relaxation um, being versus being kind of wound tight. But I'm always aware. I'm always alert. I'm always... But it's part of also being in the moment and experiencing everything in a 360. Um, not because I feel that it's uh, risky or dangerous, but just because it's unknown, and I kind of like to gather my wits and see what's going around. I look up, I look down, I look around. Um, it's part of just experiencing where you are, and it's how I've always been. I see a lot of people um, doing kind of um, thoughtless things or being distracted uh, in New York City or here in Decatur or you know anywhere in the world, and it um, doesn't always result in something in a horrible ending. But I wouldn't suggest it. They're lucky when they get away with certain things. But um, a lot of it is luck. A lot of it is just good fortune. But I do uh, have a sixth sense. I have a kind of radar, and I. Um, pride myself in thinking that over time, the more you travel, the more you become aware of how you need to conduct yourself and how you need to keep safe. And knock on wood, the only thing that has ever happened to me, ever, was being held up once about two blocks from my home in Midtown Manhattan. So, go figure. That's Stuff the happens. only thing? <laughs> you say that like that's a minor thing. Well, no, he just had a retrospect, gun. He had a gun. I gave him my things, and that was it. <laughs> no, no I problem. Was, I was really silly because I had just, just bought a well-deserved um, knock knockoff designer handbag that I really liked. That's and where I trouble refused, always starts with that handbag. <laughs> I refused to give it to him, <laughs> and it turned out he was like this 14-year-old kid that was just, you know, I guess on his first run to see what he could get away with, and he didn't get away with much. But it could have gone very poorly. It was a stupid thing. It was as much my fault as it was his um, his. And uh, so nothing ever happened, but from that point, it was a real learning lesson. It was a life lesson that you don't leave, let your guard down like that. But it was Park Avenue. It couldn't have been a safer... I don't live on Park Avenue, but that's where it happened, so you never we'll know. We'll give you credit for Park Avenue. It's a lovely neighborhood. It is. <laughs> I want to... I, I notice in, in most travel guides, they talk about uh, wear comfortable shoes. You're going to do a lot of walking. A lot of fine trips I've had have been walking. I, I was curious to know from each of you, starting with Spencer, your most favorite walkabout. Where was it? In Atlanta or just in the world? Your favorite, wherever it may have occurred. Oh, man. That's the hardest question. So You're far. the one that said it. You said you got to get down and walk. Yeah. 
Well, I, that I read your goes, literature. You did that, write this, didn't you? Sort of, <laughs> <laughs> it was ghostwritten. <laughs> uh, that was, um, there we are need days to come back where, to you. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, there, um, there are times when uh, you just head out and just go in. A, in a, I'm going to need you to declare a major here. Man, you are rigorous. Um, I actually love walking on Peachtree Road. Um, Where? I've start, I start. I live a block from Peachtree, and I'll just head out. Why? Go, go a block, turn left. Um, there's a lot of life on Peachtree. Peachtree is kind of the, the spine of Atlanta, and there's a lot that goes on there. Um, but it's also seeing the change in, um, not so much the change in seasons, but uh, the walks at dawn, where the light, the light is, you know, the God's rheostat is coming up, and the light has that bluish purple color. And uh, you're a it, poet. It, Go ahead. <laughs> Go with it. <laughs> no, it's it, it's actually it builds your circadian rhythm. I'm from the south, when we say go ahead, we're just affirming you like, oh, that's nice. That's really lovely. <laughs> You're like, what does it mean, go ahead? Leave me alone. No, it, it, it's, um, it, 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 as I think we've all agreed, it's these experiences of serendipity where you don't have a checklist. You just start out. And, and a lot of times this will happen to me when I'm traveling. I tell you what, when I go to another city, I look for the Olmstead landscapes, and Brooklyn is one of them, where, and, and Central Park gets all the glory, a lot of people in Brooklyn, let's hear it for Brooklyn, um, <laughs> Prospect oh, yeah, Park right. is often considered by many Olmstead experts to be a better park than Central Park, it's broader, it's wider, and I had never been there, I know this is a true true story before the pandemic, I got to Brooklyn and Central Park for the first, I mean, Spencer, Prospect Park. I'm going to need you to focus. We got one spot. You got the one place. One it's place. Peach Tree, right? The rest of my life, this is it. The past life. Past life. You right. get to pick a new brand new friend later. Right. Peach Tree. Got you. All Damn right. right. Peach Tree. Peach Tree it is. Jennifer. Favorite walk of all times. <laughs> You I'm guys with you, are pitiful. Spencer. I this is tough. This, I should have given you this question back in the room back there. Huh? <laughs> Give you a head start. So I can only have one, right? One. Because we're running, the, the book police telling me we're running out of time. We're about at the end here. There's a place in, um, in the National Park in Nova Scotia where you're walking and it, you, you seem like you're walking on the Appalachian Trail. And I used to be a volunteer trail maintainer for the trail here in Georgia. You, you seem like you're walking on the AT, you've got the rocks and the, the soil and you've got the hills and the, all the trees. And you round a corner on that path and suddenly you're looking at the seashore, which you would never see on the Appalachian Trail in Georgia. You, you round this corner and there's this wonderful beach with huge rocks scattered everywhere and the waves flowing and the white, the white caps and the colors. And you just look at it and you say, how, how did this happen? How can this be? And it's, it is that moment of serendipity and it is a moment of sheer joy and ecstasy mm. that mm. you don't experience many times in life, I think. Spencer, that is what I was trying to get you to do. Now, <laughs> go. I'd really, I mean, huh? I'd love to go there. Okay, great. You've been an inspiration. <laughs> Patricia, <laughs> favorite walk of all time? Uh, I'm going to make this really easy because I know that the time's a ticking. I know. Um, so, just about anywhere. <laughs> Amen. Um, whenever I arrive someplace, invariably my hotel room is never ready. So I leave my suitcase, turn off my GPS, throw the map, remember those, <laughs> out the window and wander. And it gives you a very, very, very um, local kind of insider's first take, that expression. There's only one opportunity to make a first impression. So I like to think I join the locals and kind of get out and about and um, really get quite lost. 
and then just take an Uber or a taxi back to my hotel and pray that my room is ready and collapse. But it doesn't really matter where. If you're in a new place, it's bound to be exciting. Uh, you guys have problems with commitments, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Well, have you I noticed it's a very large world? I just place, and I can't get I mean, have you noticed a little trend here? I'm not, I'm not going to commit. Mm -mm, no. So my answer is anywhere, period. Amen. Okay, yeah. I give. <laughs> <laughs> I give. Thank, thank you all for coming and uh, putting up with us and our back and forth. Uh, I believe the authors are going to be uh, at the place where they're, you're pointing. Which way is it? Come, say something, come, come, please come and give us instructions. I promised I'd follow directions. You want that? Here, there you go. If all of you would exit it. She's just adorable. Exit out the back. You should see us together standing up. Um, if, if you would all exit out that way, we will take the authors around, and the signing tent is on the left when you go out the sanctuary in the back. That good? That's great. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the Decatur Book Festival.